going to take a seat and I invite you to do so. We're going to get started up here. Good evening. I'm Joe McDermott, King County Council Member from the 8th Council District, which includes North Highline, White Center, and some other communities beyond that. And um, this is King County's chance to come and have a conversation with you tonight. Um, this is our um, CSA, Community Service Area, annual meeting. There's our chance to hear from you because being unincorporated in King County, King County is your local government. So we want to be able to engage with you and support you in every way possible to become the most empowered, engaged, and successful community um, North Highland White Center can be. And there are some challenges in doing that, certainly, both locally and regionally. Um, regionally, certainly, homelessness is one of those challenges. I stood with the mayor and the executive over two years ago when we declared a state of emergency over homelessness. And we know that that emergency persists today. Um, we know that nationally, unfortunately, many in our communities, immigrants and refugees, don't feel that as welcome and as accepted in their home as they truly should be. And so King County is stepping up in, in many ways to address those and every other issue we possibly can to create those empowered, successful, and vibrant communities. Regarding homelessness, earlier this year, the executive, the mayor, and the mayor of Auburn, and that kicked off a one table um, conversation. A chance to get people around the one table to talk about homelessness, what the causes were, and how we might address them as a regional community. And with emphasis on not addressing the symptoms, but the causes, the root causes of homelessness. I look forward to the um, final report of one table that will come out in the next couple months. And then working with our partners, cities across King County, Seattle and the other 38 cities across the county and others to address those recommendations and have, have a comprehensive approach. We're housing a number of people each year, but as we see, people become homeless, at least at the same rate. So engaging in that work. And then um, a year ago I at this meeting, I spoke about the county's creation of a resilience fund to support and empower immigrants and refugees in our communities. And today I'm able to tell you that the county is forming an immigrant and refugee commission. Um, a number of voices from across the county to serve on an commi ongoing commission to represent the issues and the voices of immigrants and refugees throughout King County, particularly in their interaction and participation with county government, and to make sure that we can do that in the most empowered and successful manner possible. Those are a couple of the ways that I wanted to open our conversation with, and then we're going to spend the first, as you saw the, on the agenda when you came in, we're going to spend the first um, almost hour of our evening until just about 8 o'clock or a minute or two after hearing from departments, and then we'll engage in a um, broader con <coughs> conversation. And so, representing the executive tonight, I want to introduce Deputy Executive and my friend, Fred Jarrett. His gratitude and thanks that you came out tonight to have a conversation with us. Um, Dow has had a number of things that he's been really focused on, and one of them is how do we improve our ability to listen and learn from each other. And we'll find tonight that uh, thanks to our help, the help of Joe and some of our uh, community services team, we're going to take some baby steps into the 21st century and be able to do some technology so that we can learn, uh, learn a bit from you. So uh, we'd be really interested in getting your feedback on that. As you know, one of the things that Dow has made a signature of his time as executive is this notion of best-run government, of how do we do things better. And we have a number of things, and if you talk to the folks uh, at the tables, they can give you some insights and, and some uh, detail around things that we've been working on to make sure that everybody has opportunity in this county, that everybody has the chance to, to uh, uh, fulfill their full potential uh, throughout their lives. One of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, and Harold uh, uh, Taniguchi will be talking a lot more about, is Dow's current initiative uh, to uh, improve the services that we deliver in the unincorporated area. Um, we want to start thinking about how do we act as a city. Uh, Joe talked a little bit about that. 
how do we find a way to be able to improve and be more flexible in the way that we deliver services? And Dow's um, um, Department of uh, Local Services is an answer to that. Uh, the council has given us direction to set that department up. We hope to have that done. We expect to have that done, and we will get that done at the end of this year. And I hope that we'll start to see some improvement. So thanks again for coming out tonight. And um, I think it is my role to turn this back to Joe, who will introduce her. Thank you. Fred is a little bit too modest about his work on the um, local services department. Gal asked Fred to take the lead on that, on the early development of that work, and Fred committed to have it done by the by last December. Fred takes a little bit of delight in on Christmas Eve showing up at Dow's house to leave a wrapped box with report on his porch. So um, Fred was meeting his deadline with a little holiday cheer. Thank you not only for the cheer, but for the work you've done on local services. Um, and it is now my pleasure to introduce the Director of Transportation and the man who is um, leading some work on implementing the Department of Local Services, um, Howard, How Harold, <laughs> Harold Taniguchi. Uh, yay! Yay! Thank you, thank you. Okay, some information about the Department of Local Services. So, um, Deputy County Executive Fred Jarrett, as uh, Council Member McDermott mentioned, put together the, the starting point and gave the executive some information to say, hey, let's go in this direction. So, about two months ago, the Council adopted a motion giving us guidance, so we're on track to have this department up and running uh, effective January 1st of 2019. So the elements of the department are basically a couple of pieces that are real key. Included in the department is the road services division and the permitting agency, a permitting department that will turn into a division. And then we will have arrangements with, you know, partnership agreements with all the other agencies that are providing services in local uh, unincorporated King County. At some point, we'll work with other elected officials like the sheriff's office and the fire districts and all that kind of stuff, but we're starting initially with the executive agencies. Now, why is this important? So in addition to the creation of this, we're hoping to be much more collaborative in our efforts. Now, um, we do come out to communities and we do seek feedback, but sometimes we do it maybe in not as organized ways as the county can. So our opportunity with this department is to be much more, hopefully much more efficient and effective when we reach out to communities and have that collaboration internally going on so you feel a little bit more like an entity is talking amongst themselves before they come out here. The other thing that we're doing is focusing on customer service. And I have the opportunity to, to say that I've been a long time county employee, over 30 years, and sometimes I have to admit that when we think of programming, we think a little bit more about our ease and ability to deliver the service and maybe a little bit less about the people that we're serving I'm just speaking for myself, you know, very candidly. But we're trying to turn that around in a big way so that we have the citizens, the community members, whomever that are part of unincorporated King County, really at the top of our brain and our mind, and Fred's a big advocate of this one since he's been here, so that the program delivery starts to feel like it has the customer focus. And you hopefully will feel that once we get up and running and we have our, our agencies building on what the great work that we're doing now, moving in that direction. And finally, is there's a connection part associated with this, and which is the outreach that we're having. This is an annual meeting uh, with the uh, community service area vibe to it, but we hope to be out there in your communities in an organized way, but really listening maybe a little bit differently than we have. And again, I'll just use myself as an example. Sometimes, I will go out to a meeting and talk for 45 minutes and get three and a half minutes of feedback and then go home. You know, and that's not really the spirit of what we're trying to do. You guys didn't laugh. I mean, I'm just kidding a, a little bit about that. But... No, you're not. No, you're not. Okay. Hey. No questions from you tonight. Okay. But, but you get the feeling that sometimes uh, we're not really listening. And we hope to definitely change that up so you do have a sense that we are really, really listening. Now, a couple of notes about the uh, Department of Transportation while I'm up here. So, I joke, but I'm not joking, the Department of Transportation will go away at the end of the year. So, if you know anybody that's in the Department of Transportation, get their business card, because those business cards aren't going to be worth anything after a year. They might be, you know, relics or anything like that, because, well, transit is becoming its own department, 
and the Department of Local Services will start, and the other agencies involved will disperse. But while we're here in 2018, there are a couple of things that the Road Services Division is, in fact, doing. We have some mini roundabout work that's going to come online, uh, be designed and constructed this year at, uh, let's see, Southwest 108th and 8th, Ave Southwest, and uh, maybe a little later next year, Southwest 102nd and 8th Ave Southwest. They're called mini roundabouts to help with the traffic flow. We're doing great drainage work on um, South 96th on 8th Avenue to address that sinkhole and some storm pipe work along that same corridor this year and next year. Uh, and we're doing some guardrail work. And on the transit side, uh, we have, uh, um, we're, I don't think there's anything dramatically different, but we have a series of all day routes located in this area. And I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce the staff that I can't see right now. Uh, there you go, Maggie's with Transit right there, Maggie McGee, and we have Brandy Reddick with Rhodes, and she's in front of the laptop. The laptop doesn't work, it's just a prop. No, I'm kidding, it does work. <laughs> she's here to answer any questions. We have um, uh, Jeremy Ferguson back there, who is our head of operations in and out of the director's office, uh, working on CSA. We have Ellen Painter, oh, and we have Susan Oxholm, and we have Bong and Marissa back here somewhere helping staff this. Now on the, the CSA side, uh, they help put together, you know, Alan and, and Susan have put together, this is where Fred was talking about getting into the 21st century. So, break out your smartphones right now. Just break them out, because this is what I want you to go to, slido.com. And what we're trying to do is find a different way of uh, soliciting input from you. So when you get to that site, slido.com, it's going to ask you for a code or whatever to say KC Local 2. And we tried this at another meeting. It seemed to work out very well. So when you get there, what you will see are these questions that I'm going to show you right here. Using one word, which is the King County, King County service or effort that has the greatest positive impact to your community. The size of the word is dependent on how many people actually use that word. So it's, this is the one word thing. During the presentations throughout the evening, we will shut this up because it's a little distracting. Uh, and just before we open up the Q&A, we'll, we'll pop it back out and see how we do it. The second question that you'll see is how should the community, or how should the new Department of Local Services best communicate with your community? And already social media is jumping out into the lead and then we have these other choices for you. And this is just the mark of how many people are participating. And you can do this uh, throughout the evening until we wrap. The third question, using one word, what is the top challenge your community faces? And then the fourth is really a question where um, you get to type in your word. How do you think King County could help solve the issue you listed in the previous question? So you identify the challenge and what do you think we need to do about it. Now I know there's like, what, maybe 30, 40 people in here, and then the other meeting we had a few dozen. This is not the end all, but we're trying to just find other ways of reaching out, getting information. And what we do notice sometimes is in meetings like this, people raise their hand and hand, you know, and talk. But other people who are maybe not inclined to do so or have other things, they feel very comfortable participating in a vehicle like this. So we're just trying it out. Okay, so I'll be back to answer any questions you have, and we will shut this off so we're not going to be distracting the next presenters, and I'll turn it back over to Councilman. Thank you, Harold. <laughs> uh, next, I'd like to introduce um, our sheriff, making her first appearance at the North Highland Community Service Area Annual Meeting, uh, but no stranger to the sheriff's office. More than 25-year veteran, um, and like me, doesn't get to live in Lake Center, but gets to live close, gets to live in West Seattle. Please join me in welcoming Sheriff Mitzi Johankman.
with the council, with the executive, with with the judges and other, just not elected officials, but everybody in county government so that we are truly one King County. Because over my 33 years in the sheriff's office, I felt kind of separated and isolated and, and not like um, we could just pick up the phone and call each other and get to work on projects for all of you. And so I'm very much in interested in doing that. I'm not as funny as Harold, but I'll try to keep your attention a little bit. Um, and as we work through pro problems and programs and, and um, come and find solutions together, because I think that's, that's the way we do our best service for you. Um, the members of the Sheriff's Office serve because they have a hard service, they enjoy this work, and they want to hear from, from the people who live in our communities. I, I live just a little bit over the hill. Um, I grew up in a, in a house uh, in Arbor Heights and then in Burien, and so I'm very familiar with um, those parts of King County, unincorporated King County, and, um, and, and I've worked at all the different precincts and so forth. So um, every precinct have, has its own unique aspects of, of community and community needs, and it, it varies. But I think one thing we can all agree on is having really good public safety that's delivered as economically as possible, um, and that is responsive to individual community needs, and so that's part of what we're doing. Very quickly, I'll tell you, we're working on um, developing a strategic plan right now. We'll be reaching out to communities as we go along. Um, that strategic plan will help us get down the road and make sure we're making decisions about services from the sheriff's office in alignment with planning purpose and a mission. So decisions we make about mission and what we, the efforts we make in your community works through that plan to make sure that uh, we're focusing on best business practices and again, working with our brothers and sisters across King County government. Um, anyway, it's been, uh, it's been an honor to serve so far. I look forward to answering questions later and uh, I'll move the mic along to the next speaker. Next, I'd like to introduce the Director of the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight, um, an office that is an independent agency within King County and housed within the legislative branch. Please welcome Deborah Jacobs. Good evening, everybody. Um, so, let's see, I have like five minutes. I'm going to see if I can smush the most quality content into my five minutes. You can let me know how I do. What is police oversight? Police oversight is one kind of police accountability. Can you guys think of any other kinds of police accountability? Internal affairs, um, lawsuits, protests, all those things are pieces. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what makes police oversight uh, distinct from those pieces. There are about 150 government police oversight offices around the country. Um, we, Olio, are an independent agency within the legislative branch of the county council. There's about five such agencies, like the auditor and the ombudsman. And um, Olio, my office, is governed by an ordinance that was adopted about a year ago in April 2017, and it was based upon the contents of a vote. In November 2015, the King County voters voted to make uh, the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight part of the county charter and expand its duties. So what are the intentions of the oversight? We're trying to uh, increase trust between the public and police, to improve confidence in police departments, and also to bring the civilian voice to police practices, which I find very important. How do we do that? In the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight, which is the same as many other offices, but do it in slightly different uh, ways. First, we look at the trees. We look at individual internal investigations and determine were they thorough and objective. If not, we go back and we talk to them a little bit about it and see if we can come to resolution. Currently, we often can. If we can't, then our office does not certify it as their own objective. What is the consequence of that? No actual consequence, but the office reports on it. Those are the trees. We also look at the forest, systemic reviews. What are the trends? How, how often is use of force being applied? What kind of force? Upon whom? By whom? Uh, how are in, incoming complaints classified? What are the tr training opportunities provided or not provided? Any of those things could be a subject of a systemic review. We also give the sheriff uh, feedback on policies. 
Uh, in our new ordinance, we have an opportunity before they're adopted to give community input, and we often come up with suggestions that kind of bring that public perspective into the picture a little bit better. The sheriff has the option to take or leave, and often they take some and leave some, which is perfectly fine. Uh, we also conduct public outreach. Uh, that's me here tonight. We also hope in the future to partner with the sheriff's office on more and more public outreach and the council people as well. We think there can't be enough outreach to let the people of King County know what's available to them and what's offered. Um, we, so under the vote of November 2015, the office was supposed to expand its duties to include um, independent investigations. That and some other parts are still subject to collective bargaining with the police unions. We'll see down the line what happens with that. Uh, last thing I would say is we have a joint mediation program, the Sheriff's Office and the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight, and um, we give the opportunity to members of the public and, and deputies from the Sheriff's Department to have a dialogue, a facilitated dialogue about um, the issues that came up between them. We think that's a really effective way to advance understanding between both parties. Last thing I'll say is this is probably about my 10th meeting like this, and at not one has anyone ever asked me a question. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight could be my night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sending it right now, Deborah. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. We think of your questions, right? Um, we have some great parks in, in this community. Um, Steve Cox Park, Dick Thurneau Park. And our next speaker is the Director of Natural Resources and Parks, Kevin Brown. Kevin? And I know this isn't a competition. Sorry, Mitzi. But that Carl's font was pretty small. <laughs> uh, so I'm Kevin Brown. I'm the Parks Division Director. And I'm here representing the Department of Natural Resources and Parks, which has four agencies, uh, Wastewater Treatment Division, uh, solid Waste Division, the Water and Land Resources Division, and of course the Parks Division. And um, parks in this area are pretty special, and we could actually just look out this window into uh, Dick Thurnell Memorial Park and see that. Uh, we have roughly seven or eight parks uh, remaining in this area. Uh, Dick Thurnell, Steve Cox Memorial Park, uh, we have Ham Creek, we have the White Center Bog, uh, we've got North Shorewood, and I think I might be missing one. Um, White Center Heights, thanks. Um, and to that, we have a map, actually, of all the parks on our uh, table right there. Darlene has uh, got that for display. <laughs> um, so what's happening? Uh, well, uh, coming uh, August 4th, uh, just in this park here, we're going to have movies in the park. Uh, so please tell everybody, tell your friends, and uh, have a great crowd. I'm not sure the movie's been announced quite yet. I don't think so. But stay tuned for that. Uh, and if you haven't seen the Technology Access Foundation building, or right here, which connects technology uh, to kids in the community, uh, really you should take an opportunity to walk through the public space. We have a lot of public meetings there as well. It's just a really, really great partnership here. Um, Steve Cox Memorial Park. There is a lot cooking. And when I say a lot cooking, I really do mean it. Because we just got a grant for our burnt toast program. Uh, which teaches kids how to cook. Uh, it also provides summer sack lunches for kids at both Steve Cox Memorial Park and this year Dick Thurnell Park. Uh, Darlene right here actually manages all the programming, all the operations at Steve Cox Park. She's been in the community for how many years now? Sixteen. Sixteen years. She started mm -hmm. when she was two. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's just a great opportunity this year to do a little bit more uh, given the grant funding that we do have. Uh, coming up on June 6th, we're going to be having an event, Peace in the Hood. Uh, it's actually uh, connecting <coughs> local youth between the ages of 16 and 24 and employers in the region uh, to you know, look for opportunities for finding uh, employment for uh, kids in the community. And there's been a lot of success over the years and uh, just uh, listening to some perhaps page positions at the library that might be needed. Thank you. But uh, one of the big announcements is at Steve Cox Memorial Park, we're actually going to be constructing a multi-sport synthetic field. It's about a $3 million project. Um, it's going to be multi-sports in that it'll serve <coughs> baseball, lacrosse, uh, uh, soccer. Um, just We've had this incredible program 
uh, for probably the last 10 years within Steve Cox Memorial Park. The Aztecs, we have youth programs for both uh, boys and girls. Uh, they've been having to travel for a lot of their games. Uh, this will be one of the first synthetic fields in this area, uh, publicly available. It's a big, big project for us uh, and the community as well. We'll have some lighting and some pathways and other improvements uh, there as well. Um, Jubilee days. Um, this is one of the challenges with construction of a project. Typically, Jubilee Days is held at uh, Steve Cox Memorial Park. Um, the project construction is going to displace it this year. Uh, we've been look, working with organizers to uh, try to find alternative sites. So we've offered some resources. We're sort of waiting to hear uh, what the next steps are. So understanding that we have some challenges uh, with the ball field development um, that uh, is going to displace Jubilee Days. But, trying to figure out how best to move forward with that. And I think those all the comments from UNRB. And our next presenter is from the Department of Permitting and Environmental Review. I'm Jake Tracy. Hi, everybody. As you heard, my name is Jake Tracy. I'm a planner with the Department of Permitting and Environmental Review. And my specific job within our department is uh, to deal with all things marijuana, which I know is, uh, has been a hot topic here in uh, this area for several years. So I'm excited to be here today um, to talk to you, uh, hear your thoughts, and to let you know about an ongoing land use study that we have on the marijuana industry in King County, uh, looking particularly at unincorporated areas and also a public comment period that we have going on right now um, in association with that. So just to give a little background, uh, back in 2016, uh, the King County Council and Executive passed um, new regulations around marijuana businesses in unincorporated areas. Um, those, that legislation started as, uh, in part as a result of feedback from the North Highland community about uh, clustering of retail marijuana businesses in this area. Among other things, that legislation required a 1,000-foot uh, separation between any new retail marijuana business and any existing retail marijuana business, and uh, put into place tighter um, grandfathering restrictions than for any other kind of use in the uh, unincorporated areas. As a result of that, we've seen uh, two state-licensed businesses that were in White Center move to other areas of the county. Uh, one to Vashon, and one is in the process of moving to Lake Forest Park. So we have seen some positive movement in terms of dispersion as a result of that legislation. Um, so when that was passed, the council also asked the deeper study a number of topics around the marijuana industry. Um, and so we, there's a wide variety of things we're looking at, but it generally falls into five categories. So one is, where are the existing marijuana businesses in uh, the county and unincorporated areas in particular? Uh, how have they arranged themselves? Uh, what patterns emerge? Basically, what are the existing conditions there? Two is, how much land is currently available under the current zoning, uh, given the 1,000-foot separation, youth setbacks, that sort of thing, for, um, for marijuana businesses? Third is do we need to open up additional zoning areas for marijuana businesses uh, to meet our requirements uh, and our allocation of businesses from the state. Fourth is what impacts have unincorporated area residents experienced as a result of the legal marijuana industry? And I'll come back to that in just a second. And then finally, um, how can we mitigate any negative impacts that we find? Increase social justice and equity in the marijuana industry and also uh, provide better access for medical patients. So on that topic of impacts, um, we're taking a data-driven approach, looking at crime, um, enforcement, and also complaint data from a number of agencies so that we have a really thorough and um, comprehensive view of what impacts are occurring. But we also want to hear from you. Um, so have you experienced any impacts positive or negative from the marijuana industry, we want to hear that. Or maybe you haven't experienced any impacts, we want to hear that too. Um, so we have a public comment website that's up now. It's at uh, kingcounty.gov slash kcmarijuanastudy. 
And uh, we don't feel like you have to write that down. We've got flyers back at our table. Feel free to grab one on your way out. The comment period is open through the end of uh, June. And um, we really look forward to hearing your feedback on that. Thanks. And now from the Department of Community and Human Services, um, our next presenter is Mark Ellerbrook. Mark, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Mark Ellerbrook. I uh, work for the Department of Community and Human Services. I manage the housing and community development program uh, for the county. I see a lot of familiar faces uh, from folks in the room, partially from being here uh, the last few years doing these meetings, and also uh, from some of the work we've been doing on homeless services in the, the region, including the um, shelter that we opened up at the public health clinic. So for folks um, who don't know, I'm going to go over what services uh, community human services provides, and I'm happy to answer questions when we do the Q&A uh, section. As I mentioned, I manage the housing um, and homeless program for the county, and that includes all programs that we work to fund and support affordable housing throughout the county, both in incorporated and unincorporated areas, as well as all of the homeless services, including uh, shelters uh, and service programs to support people who are living outdoors. Um, in addition to um, that, we do our uh, basic community services uh, program, which is domestic violence, um, sexual assault, and uh, programs for adults, um, particularly older adults. Uh, we do a lot of work in the behavioral health area, so um, folks know that we provide mental health and substance use services throughout the uh, county, including the 24-7 outreach that we provide for folks who are able to call if they're having uh, an immediate uh, mental health issue. Uh, we are also working on the opiate crisis. Uh, it's one of the major uh, focus areas for the behavioral health group in the um, uh, Department of Community and Human Services. What we are um, working on countywide is really um, increasing access to um, services uh, and treatment on demand so that folks that are having um, uh, issues with behavioral health at that moment, whether they be substance use or other mental health conditions, are able to call and get treatment at that moment, not wait a day or multiple days to get that service, but that we're able to um, work immediately to help those folks so that it doesn't escalate um, or become even more problematic. And so we are working on that together with um, Sheriff's Office and others, as well as philanthropy, to make that happen. We also have increased access to detox services throughout the county. We opened a new detox facility in Seattle in 2017. Uh, we are working to open another one in 2018, and that is all part of our effort to provide sort of expanded services uh, in the mental health area. Beyond that, we work um, in some other areas, developmental disabilities, both with um, early intervention for infants and toddlers, uh, so that we know that if you're able to identify um, toddlers, babies that have developmental dis delay, the quicker we're able to get services to um, those um, children, the better they ultimately have as, uh, in outcomes. And then for adults who have um, developmental delay, uh, we have supported employment programs that we are actually working to expand in part um, due to our efforts around homelessness. So um, that's on developmental uh, disabilities. Employment and education is another area that we work both on youth uh, employment and for adults looking at um, GEDs. We uh, have a couple different programs both in the north uh, part in Shoreline and in south uh, area in Tukwila that really work to support folks uh, employment. People are probably aware that in 2017, the county passed the Vet Seniors and uh, Human Services Levy. Uh, that's exciting for one, because it added seniors to a population. Uh, as part of that, that we're able to now provide services directly to and expand those services. Uh, and then actually, that levy uh, kind of runs across all of the Department of Community and Services, from homeless services to adult services, it supports for senior centers, support for housing repair programs. It kind of runs the, grant, the, the gamut and allows us to really expand and enhance services that we're able to provide uh, throughout. And then specific veterans programs, we are working part through the Vet Seniors and Human Services Levy and a part through existing programs that we already have to support veterans to really um, reach out and provide services to um, our veterans in this community. And there is more information uh, available on that uh, program over there uh, at the table. So I'm going to stop there, run through really quickly the DCHS services. I know folks will have questions uh, from this group on, on what uh, we are doing and where we are involved in all that area, and turn that back over to you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you, 
Um, will you join me for a moment in thanking our host tonight, King County Housing Authority, David Dawes. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. We're going to invite Harold back up with the results. Harold? Hey! You've been waiting for it anyway. Yes. All right. Let's turn that thing on. All right, let's turn that thing on. Give it a drum roll. Drum roll. Okay, let's quietly close our eyes and think if we predicted correctly what the one word answer is. Okay, 15 of us participated, of you participated, and go. One word which is King County, the King County Service or effort that has had the greatest positive impact and it looks like the Sheriff and Parks are the top two. Give them a round of applause. So actually, I think the Sheriff edges out because this is probably this category here too. So, Oh, you're right, you're right. But I think this is bigger than that. So, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, nicely done, nicely done. Kevin and company. Okay, next one. Okay, the, the question, how best to communicate? And social media, Facebook, Nextdoor, and all that seems to be the clear winner. Interestingly enough, the other meeting that we went to, email was by far the clearest winner. So we have very different tastes throughout the, the uh, unincorporated areas of the county. Next one. Close on it up to 100%, so I'm not... Uh, was it just because it was multiple choice? Yeah. You can vote more than once. Okay. So it's not that scientific. Okay. <laughs> the top challenge of community faces. So, safety and homelessness are clearly the two things that are on most people's mind as the top challenges that we face. Wow. Interesting. Okay, in the last one, so let's just walk through these real quickly here. How do you think King County could help solve the issue you listed in the previous question? So bringing people together, deny applicants that have been in any of the top hat and white center area. I, I, I am not sure what the applications are referring to, but that's a follow question. <coughs> Marijuana stores. Marijuana stores, okay. Um, work together within King County government. We are certainly working on that. Continue to develop subsidized and affordable housing, working closely with White Center Business District, work closely with schools, continue support of the White Center Community Development Association. There's a roads one, build more sidewalks, facilitate more affordable housing, tax breaks, investment in infrastructure, uh, increase mental health resources, coordinate, increase presence of the police, homelessness prevention, more law enforcement, greater presence, and uh, cap property tax assessment or do them less often. So that's kind of a, kind of like the throw up of um, throwing up of several words or sentences that I, I not throw up. I saw the wrong word there. Forgive me, but you know, just kind of like a, a off the top thinking of the folks in the room. What's what's kind of on your mind in terms of how we can help solve those issues? All right, turn it back over to the council member now. Oh, before I do that, though, there is a whole host of folks from the county. Just let me read off the wonderful agencies that I forgot to mention. Our communications person in our DOT. Jerry Pionk, but here are the departments that are represented back there. Assessor's Office, Public Health, Office of Emergency Management, Office of Cable Compliance, Regional Animal Services, Performance Strategy and Budget. And they're all around here to answer all of your questions, and that's in addition to the folks that came up here and said a few things in the front. So, turn it over to the council. Great, thank you. Thanks for the for that style of input and dialogue, now let's have more of a traditional, if you will, Q&A conversation. Questions, inquiries, thoughts to share? Liz. Very troubling. 
in that email, I stated that I think the county is, a, is that part to blame for the situation. The murders of those girls were associated with gangs. Gangsters as young as 10 years old. Kids, not necessarily gangsters, watched those girls get murdered. I later learned that one of the girls had an aunt who had been murdered last year in White Center, not far from here. There's a relationship. We had um, the gang expert from the King County Sheriff's Office, thank you, Sheriff Quincy, come to our new WAC meeting, and he told us that poverty is more associated with gangs these days than race. Poverty. There is a lot of poverty in White Center. And I wonder what anyone, what any of you are doing to make us a more healthy community, to stop the concentration of poor people, because kids deserve to live in healthy neighborhoods that offer opportunities. And White Center is not becoming that. There is an effort, there's a new project going in at Top Hat. It's like four buildings going to have almost 300 units, and the latest estimation I saw of how many people could possibly live there is over 1,400. The county was told when they applied that it could be 623 more or less. Bottom line, what are you doing? What plan is there? Because the, our government, our local and our regional government, King County, has a lot of responsibility here. Is there any answer? Thank you. Is there enough of an answer? Um, probably not. But what is King County doing? What have we done? What proactive steps have we taken to step up? Um, I would identify a couple. Um, off the top. The best starts for kids levy, recognizing that um, we need to have greater investment in youth and make sure that every child has um, the best opportunity they have in our community to succeed and be successful. And so King County has what I believe is the first in the nation levy that invests half of the funds in pregnant women and children under the age of five so they truly get off to the best start possible. And then the next amount of, of that levy supports kids from that age through um, 14, and then also um, invest in communities of opportunity, of which White Center is one. Recognizing that we needed new opportunities and new ways to invest. The County General Fund doesn't do that. The um, Enterprise Funds that support dedicated programs within King County um, don't, do, don't do that. And so we started the Best Starts for Kids Levy as a way to take, take a step in that direction. Also, the expansion of the <coughs> Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services Levy, because human particularly the human services portion invests in people who are in need um, throughout the community and uh, making those resources available um, in White Center and throughout King County are ways that the county is stepping up. Jill. The King County and Communities of Opportunity are working together to try to get neighborhood approval for yet another low-income housing project where the public health building is now. That's more concentration what schools are these young people going to go to? The, my thought really is that all of the county and Seattle needs to become more open. And, you know, 
Roseanne Barr lost her job today. That's a good thing. We need to acknowledge that racism is very endemic and work against it. And when you continue to shove people that need help into one small space that's four and a half or three and a half square miles, you're going to wind up with trouble. And it's going to hurt the whole area. I was born in Chicago. I grew up, grew up there. Racism and segregation are not the way to go. It's not healthy at all. So I would really like to see the county take another look. And I would like to see Executive Dow Constantine and the council step up. I realize it's not easy, but it's got to happen. And White Center is a real prime example. So I would ask that you reconsider what's happening in the public health building. We could really use a meeting place for the, if you're going to build something. Build a place where the CBA can have their offices. Southwest Youth can have their offices. Other organizations can meet and flourish. Have a, a community space where we can learn about each other, their history, our ethnicity. Really take advantage of what we've got here now. I'm done now. Thank you. I'll hand over to the sheriff for comment on that as well, but I also want to point out that we're balancing uh, multiple needs, uh, many needs at the same time. As we talk about homelessness and, and the need for more affordable housing, we, it's not just in White Center, it's throughout our communities that more housing needs to be built um, and we need to be able to accommodate. And how do we make sure that's um, equitably um, distributed across the county? We need to make sure that it still may, may result in um, more housing than some, more affordable housing in some communities than some people who are there now would like to see. Yeah. Hey, Liz, thanks for the question. Um, just to give an update, um, we still have a very intense investigation going into the deaths of the two young girls, one young woman and young, young girl. Um, in the next two weeks, I'll be traveling to Vancouver to meet with one, uh, one of the gal's family members and then uh, also making arrangements to meet with uh, a second gal who lives more locally with her, fam with her uh, family. So the intent of that is I've been working with Lou Martinez of the uh, Latino Civic Alliance, statewide alliance, to speak about um, gang activities specifically in the Latino communities and, and how we can work together to overcome that without um, you know, it would be easy for me to say we've, we've got one gang guy, right, for all of the sheriff's office um, and complain about not having enough. But it's about intersecting throughout all the different resources of King County government and coming together and, and you know, meeting with families and learning about culture and specific gang culture and how we can, what, what do we finger point at to, um, to look at the, the root cause of that. And it is poverty, it's a variety of things. It's, it's the family that you've grown up in and that's just part of the family culture and, it's a, and it, it's a, it goes across boundaries. It is less and less about um, selling drugs, interesting enough. So um, anyway, I wanted you to know that we're working on it. We are working. We're close to solving, but there's so much that goes into this. And, and a lot of what we're doing, you can't see. Um, and so I ask that you uh, have a little, uh, little more extended faith in the faith that you've given us already um, to, to bring the perpetrator, perpetrators of that to justice. It is uh, difficult in, uh, in the community, uh, in the gang community, to solve those things. Seattle paid 
sending bombs over the first <laughs> <laughs> first cloud. I know I've got. So, um, but anyway, I'll let County Councilman Mark okay. McDermott kind of walk through that. Yeah, thank you. Minimum wage, ham part. Ham creek. Ham creek. Uh, Miles uh, Myers parcels too. There are both and. And was there a third? Uh, wages, uh, the Popey report. Popey report. The navigation right. style. Some, some of the poppy report, um, I'll, I'll take an initial stab and I'll turn it over to Mark Illibrook. Um, some of the initial poppy, some of the recommendations of the poppy report, the, the city and the county have already undertaken. For instance, moving the, um, the entry program into the county from the city as far as who's running it, administrating it. And um, one table is unique in that it is um, doing work to Identify and, and address the root causes of homelessness. Not the the poppy report addressed many issues about um, administration and how it was running, how we were addressing the crisis. And then one table, um, my optimism about one table is that it is deeper in actually trying to address the root causes, understanding what causes people to become homelessness and address those issues. Um, and certainly, um, wages is one of those. As Seattle has increased their minimum wage, um, the rest of King County and the rest of the county has not. And my authority as a council member would, would only affect unincorporated King County. And so it would be White Center, it would be um, Vashon, it would be Skyway. It wouldn't be Burien, SeaTac, Tecwilla, three other Sorry. cities that make up parts of my district. And so it becomes rather piecemeal. Um, Seattle covers a large swath, but I would also um, point to a, the state as um, setting a statewide minimum wage that I think responds well to the region. And I think that that was basically that would elevate everyone if we all had a minimum wage that you know, we could get rid of low income and poverty, and we should have that. Right. And then, Mark, if you want to elaborate? Sure. Yeah, I'm tripping over the yeah, page down there. So. Uh, thank you for the question, and actually, Liz, thank you for your question, too, and I'm going to kind of touch on a few different things. So um, I very much appreciate your comments around affordable housing, and this is, um, as the one table discussion points out, as the council member points out, there is a, a pretty direct relationship between homelessness and affordable housing throughout the region. If you look at the numbers right now, um, our best estimate is that we have somewhere between an 80 and 90,000 unit gap in affordable housing countywide. So that is where we sit today between the people who need affordable housing and what we have available. We need more affordable housing in every community in, um, in King County and beyond. And we need to be part of that conversation collectively, how White Center, how Bellevue, how any of those places all participate in making sure that that housing is spread equally throughout the region is the appropriate uh, way to be having that discussion. And by showing that we are welcoming to that in certain places, that helps other places be willing to accept it as well. So I think that's an important piece. There is a very close connection between what we have for affordable housing or lack thereof and homelessness. I think I don't have the slides to show you, but I can. Um, I, you know, the the evidence is pretty clear. There have been a number of reports that have talked uh, about that. As far as where we are on addressing homelessness and sort of what we see, uh, I think last year when we looked at the point in time count, there were about 11,500 people on that one night in January that we counted people throughout the county that were homeless that night. Some of whom were in shelter, some of whom were um, on the streets. If you look at how many people have actually become homeless over the course of a year in King County, it is actually almost 30,000 people. And so we talk about that 11,000 number, but that's a one-time, one-night number. Over the course of the year, it is many, many thousands more. And actually, if you look at the number of people who exited our homeless system, um, we actually had about 24,000 people who actually came in for services, um, addressed their homelessness, and did not return for services. Some of those people moved away, some of them didn't seek services again, but many, many of them did. So the crisis response system that we operate throughout the county does address homelessness for many, many people. The problem is, is that we have even many more who become homeless over the course of the year. We have a gap. 
And so when we look at the one table effort, as you said, council member, we're really looking at the root cause. How do we keep it so that people don't become homeless in the first place? And therefore, we're able to provide the services to those folks over time. And so the areas that we're working on in one table are affordable housing, which I commented on, behavioral health, criminal justice, <coughs> child welfare, and employment. And I think to your, um, to your question and to your point, employment is critical. People are only earning $15 an hour, if that, and that is just in Seattle, and rents at $1,500 to $2,000 for an apartment, that math just simply does not work, right? And so if I lose my job, if I have to go out because I'm sick um, for a period of time, I very well may lose my apartment and never be able to get back in. And so the answer isn't any one component of that. It is all of those things um, working together to create sort of the housing and the support system that we have uh, to be able to make that work. As far as the uh, Bar Poppy report, um, as the council member said, we have worked to implement a number of those um, standards, really getting people to move through our shelter system more quickly into housing, trying to look at a number of our nonprofit providers and making sure that they are housing um, the people who are most in need. We continue to work um, on a number of those outcomes. Uh, and I think one of the other um, points that um, that report made and that we have been working on, and I think an evidence is here in White Center, is the shelter system. We have a shelter system throughout the county, but we hear from many um, people who experience homelessness that they don't want to go to the shelter system. They can't go with their partners. They can't take their dog. They don't want to sleep right next to somebody else who is not well. Uh, and I think, you know, we may very well be able to understand that. But if we're able to provide a shelter system that has services available 24-7, that you don't need to leave in the morning uh, and go out and wander the streets and then come back in at 7 o'clock at night, we know that A, people are healthier, B, they're able to get connected to services, uh, and then work to address the underlying causes of folks' homelessness. So those are the changes that we are working to make. It is a big system with lots um, going on, and we are trying to correct that as we can. Additional resources with the Vet Seniors and Human Services Levy will certainly help, and we are coordinating as best we can with all of the jurisdictions throughout the county, including the city of Seattle, to really um, do the best we can for folks who are experiencing homelessness. Does King County have a navigation team? Like Seattle has one, by the way. Seattle has one navigation team. We um, do our funding um, system for things like outreach and um, shelter services every two years. This is the year that we do that. Um, and navigation and outreach to vehicle residents are one of the things that we're trying to add in to our funding round this year. Um, we, you know, the prevalence for of folks living in vehicles um, is certainly something you see more and more on the streets, and we feel like that's an area that we need to enhance and expand um, our services to work to address that. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's some challenges to the equity of subsidized housing, from what I can tell. I was just in a conversation with a young lady who's in a uh, who's low income, and we have subsidized housing in a in a very large um, uh, unit that that is receiving a, almost six hundred thousand dollars of property tax subsidy from the county. Mm -hmm. um, that's how big it is. And every year they relevel their rents based on what can be justified. I'm not sure what the exact formula is. Uh, but what I also learned is, and, and I've noticed a lot of cars being parked along the state highway, which this property abuts. Um, and it turns out that parking is not included with that rent level. Mm -hmm. So they charge extra. Uh, these units were all built with built-in washers and dryers. That's an extra charge also. So um, it, it seems like um, there's a lot going on there, and perhaps a, a lot that should be looked into a little more closely. Sure, so I can address a couple of those things. So I think there's different varieties of affordable housing, some of which we in the county work to subsidize, and some is available um, through various tax credit programs. As far as parking, that's a local jurisdiction, and what that local jurisdiction, if it's incorporating uh, county or federal way, what they require as far as parking that goes along with the units. The um, rent 
level on any apartment, whether it has a washer dryer or how that works, is set, if it's a federal program, is set by the Department of Housing and Urban Development at a maximum that can be charged. Uh, and so people can, um, that's kind of where the rent level is, and then they work to income qualify people based on um, what they earn. And so that's kind of how it works, but there are different programs, not all of which we um, put funds in or administer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I have, um, on the Jubilee days in 2017, our North Highline Unincorporated Area Council had a petition, um, and it was addressed to King County Executive Dow Constantine and the entire King County Council, and I'd like to read it. It's free. Um, and it was regarding affirmatively furthering fair housing and opportunity in North Highline neighborhoods. Recognizing that opportunity gives people access to what they need to succeed, according to a 2011 opportunity mapping analysis, White Center is a low opportunity neighborhood with some of the worst <coughs> health outcomes in King County, ranking number one for diabetes related deaths, infant mortality, and heart disease. The report also cites academic achievement and poverty challenges. School poverty has serious implications not just for students, but for districts, communities, and the region. In 1970, North Highline's median household income was $1,200 less than King County's. By 2010, the gap had grown to almost 30,000, and 25% of us were living in poverty. The Seattle King County region is experiencing a high tech boom. Despite the wealth of information it could be accumulating, King County continues to rely on programs to achieve social equity. Programs are important, but they come and go. Policies are the way government makes real lasting change. Good government requires fact-based policies. The people of North Highline deserve to live in a community of opportunity. We have about eight pages of signatures that we gathered. We spoke with a lot of people. And we asked that King County conduct a fair housing assessment an opportunity analysis of North Highland community as part of White Center's Community of Opportunity designation. And I'd also like to give a copy to Joe and to Fred Jarrett. Thank you. Gil? <coughs> Gil, uh, Gil Warren. Uh, my biggest concern, I've lived here since 1998, Biggest concern is what I saw in the meeting until we got the other people coming Thank God. Uh, most everyone here is white. The county is not reaching out to the ethnic minorities. The people that make up, I think, the majority of the community now, in one sense, are not white. You know? And we're not reaching out. They feel like they're not part of the community. Um, I had an incident yesterday, briefly. I was down by North Shore Park, walking along the street, neighbor says a bunch of mail got thrown across the street, she reported it, parts phone came right away and got it. Then a guy came over, who I found out was Vietnamese, who was working his car, and he said, said, anything like that, you know, just report it. Report to 911. He says, why didn't waste my time? He says, you call and you'll get him right away. What do you mean? And I had to explain to him, that's not the way I feel in my center. Not from the people I know in my center, not from the sheriff's department either. And we have some, a couple excellent deputies in the city, by the way. But the county's not coming out. We're not getting together. You know, until this youth group came in tonight, we were the majority white. And I don't want to see that change. And I don't see the county doing it. I've complained about this for years and meetings, you see meetings for years. And it really bothers me. And that also leads to the drug problems that we see too, you know. And the gang activity, which I understand is, is down now. I've heard that from the sheriff too. But I don't know what to do. And I don't hear it from the county. I don't hear it from Dow. I don't hear it from the council. I don't hear those kind of concerns being placed. Because if we can deal with that and bring people together, and yeah, I know it's a national problem now too. That, but that even focuses kind of more on our community because we have the, I think, human resources in Washington, particularly in King County area, to deal with this kind of 
stuff. You know, let's let's all come together. Let's all be part of the same human community. I don't care what color you are. I care what you are as a person. And why can't the county do something about that? Thank you. <coughs> does some of that work through our equity and social justice work in really making it, making an effort to um, examine and view any policy we enact through a lens of equity and social justice to be, to evaluate how it's going to affect people throughout the county and particularly um, minorities, people who are historically challenged. And we've talked about that. I know I've been to NUAC and talked about that. Um, obviously, the county needs to talk more about the work we do, both formally with um, equity and social justice, but also in outreach, and be more successful in some of our outreach efforts. Um, and you're right in another, in another factor that you didn't touch on, or, you, or alluded to indirectly, because until a large number of um, people joined us um, partway through our evening, we were also older. And that doesn't um, truly reflect the community either. So, in many ways, the people who joined us later in the conversation are vital representatives of the White Center community. And so, welcome. And um, your questions, your comments, your feedback about how County, um, King County can work better with White Center is most welcome tonight. Sir? So, to maybe transition, just kind of like that, uh, give some thoughts there. The youth in the group uh, present right now they are part of the internship. trying to get you civically engaged. Uh, so I wanted to actually see if they wanted to speak. They spent a little bit of time leading up to this, kind of organizing and getting some ideas of issues that are important to them. So if you guys are ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is your chance. Hi, everyone. My name is Clarissa Perez. Um, like I said, I'm with the ship of White Center to White House. And um, this is directed towards you, um, Council Member Joe McDermott. Um, um, yeah, sure. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Um, and this is in regards to the Children and Family Justice Center. So, dear Council Member Joe McDermott, the youth of White Center are concerned with the construction of the new jail targeting young people of color in King County. We find that the construction of this detention center contradicts the goals that the county has in place with their equity and social justice strategic plan. The funding for the jail came from a levy that deceived voters into thinking that the center would service the justice needs of children and families. King County claims that it's trying to reduce youth detention rates, and yet this brand new facility would do exactly the opposite of that. Construction costs have already exceeded the proposed budget. As young people, we are severely, severely impacted by King County's investment in caging our friends and family. We believe that the money used for this project could instead go towards community-based prevention, intervention, and diversion services and programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and the county is in the project. Oh, thanks. We do right now have an, under construction a new um, Children and Family Justice Center, and it replaces our ex the existing um, youth jail facility, detention facility at 12th and Alder. Um, the current facility holds, has about 200 beds. Um, our, our average daily population used to be over 200. Now it's about 50. And when we reduce the population, so, um, that's a significant um, decrease in population not at our aspirational goal of zero youth detention, which is an aspirational goal, but one that we have to hold up as our aspiration to be able to um, find the best policies to further reduce our um, jail population, our youth jail population. But um, I also want to acknowledge that as we've reduced the population, um, which I think is a very good outcome, we have not done a good job of um, addressing disproportionality within that population because we have not significantly um, reduced the disproportionality within that the remaining 50. It's about the same percentage as it was at 200. So that's work that um, King County needs to can, to do more work on and more and find best practices, successful rates to to engage in that work. 
But, to, but I also want to emphasize the fact that I believe that it, the new facility is necessary, is needed, because in, while we have, what, until we reach our aspirational goal of zero youth detention, there will be some number of youth in detention. But why build a jail for 50 people and maybe use different, like other services, like I mentioned, or like we wanted? Because um, if that's, I mean, you said 250, right? So yeah, like why spend all this money? Was it over like 200 million dollars? The, the levy is for $205 million, and that is the total price for both the detention facility and um, some of the family courts and some of the um, <coughs> services. Um, the overall construction, the overall building, is more than the des detention facility itself. Um, it is um, justice services, um, di diversion programs, so that kids can enter a program without um, ever being without ever having a conviction in the first place. So they don't have that on their record. Um, so we can expand programs like that to keep people, keep youth out of jail in the first place. Uh, and those space and facilities and ability for those services are lacking right now. And that's something that the new facility will include that we don't have now, which should help us further our goals. Um, why not go to like community-based like prevention programs? For those, for many, that's going to be successful. We need to do more. We have some, and we need to do more community-based services. And then there will be a. Um, at this point in time, we're not at our aspirational goal, and there will still be a small number. We can still reduce that 50, um, but there will be some number that I believe separation for their own safety and for that of the community is is important. And so, um, it, we need to expand our community-based services our less restrictive alternatives. Um, if, if detention, if jail isn't the right place for you, then we need to have the place that is right for you. But if, but if there are kids who, for their own protection or that of the community, need to be in detention, um, I believe that continuing the work on the Children and Family Youth Justice Center is um, an important investment for the county. And again, I want to emphasize that it's not just the detention beds, it is also the the wraparound services that will um, support the community and support those kids. <coughs> Are you aware that Snohomish County uh, decided to close their jail and use it as a Flexibility so that um, those that aren't required for, for secure detention can be used for um, residential-based services. Right. So we have we have thought about that in designing the facility. Uh, the so we have flexibility in how to do it. Yeah. At the same at the same time, um, I, I can't believe that Snohomish County has eliminated their youth jail because there is a state law to have one for one. I agree entirely. Fred? So one of the things that Al's asked um, one of my colleagues to do is to put together a plan for how to get to zero detention. Rhonda Berry, who was uh, uh, my colleague as deputy county executive for some years, is now leading that effort. That came out of a lot of the work that we did in putting the plan together for the Children and Family Justice Center. The building is has, um, as Joe's talked about, has several different um, uh, roles. Today we have a court uh, building that has uh, no place for uh, parents and lawyers and uh, kids to be able to have a private conversation. Um, it has brown water. It has, uh, uh, it's, it's just not a pleasant place to be. I, my, my wife and I just celebrated her 74th, uh, 74th birthday and her first job out of college as a social worker was in the building that we're replacing. It is an old building, it is in disrepair, and the vast, the, the largest part of what this investment is, is replacing that building, which is the court facility, um, the support for um, um, uh, family reunions, for uh, um, um, uh, 
kids who are um, in the in the in the in the um, uh, foster care system. A portion of it is the detention facility. We've reprogrammed part of the detention facility to be non-secure, uh, safe places for kids to to be able to be when they are in a family crisis and need a place <coughs> to sleep at night outside of a jail. The other thing that has come out of all of this work is a realization that this is a complicated problem. It's not just a simple problem of saying, let's not have a detention facility. It is something that if you really wanted to have zero detention, you probably needed to start about 20 years ago. Because all of the things that we've talked about tonight, about kids growing up, of families, all of those things have a part and a role to play in this. The reason Dow and the council have been so um, active in putting together programs like Best Starts for Kids, um, like the Communities of Opportunity, like the Seniors, Veterans, and, and um, uh, Human Services Levy, all of those things are ways that we as a region are trying to invest in kids and families to be able to avoid some of these problems. We've also been working with school districts, and one of the things that I'm most proud of is over the last two or three years, the South King County school districts have re reduced suspensions to almost zero. At the same time, the East King County school districts have been increasing suspensions. And we know there's a direct relationship between suspensions and dropping out of school. We know there's a direct relationship between kids dropping out of school and getting into these kinds of difficulties. So we've got to look not just at the simple question of do we have a detention facility, we have to have, uh, we have to look at all of, the all of the parts of the problem, all of the root causes. And I think that's what we've been trying to do. I think that's what Dow has been leading us to do. Joe has been a great supporter and, and an advocate in that effort. And I know of no place in the United States that's doing as good a job as King County is. And I've looked at places in, I've had people come tell me, go look here, go look there, go look another place. And what I find is that there's some pieces that maybe they're doing well at, but systematically, I don't think anyone's doing any better than we are. But we can do a lot better. Um, Always. Thanks. Uh, I just want to, it's more like a logistics question. How many beds do you guys plan on building in this, uh, this uh, center? My memory is 60. 60? Down from 200. The original plan was 200. The number, I think, is 60 or just over 50. And um, those will be in pods of, I believe, 12. And um, so they'll be flexible, as I spoke to, about use. And um, we're, we're still building that many, even with a, a goal of re further reducing the population, um, because um, you have one young man and one young woman in detention that night. You're going to have two pods activated, right. so 24 beds activated that night. Right. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, my name is Everett. And Everett. Everett. You might need that. Um, so, the youth here, we're aware that the King County doesn't really um, go into like school affairs and all that, like such, but um, we are writing to urge the King County uh, Council to allocate resources to high, uh, to high need schools in White Center. Uh, one example would be Evergreen High School, which is right on the same block. Um, these are four areas that we've identified that need um, like help. So uh, one would be more rigorous opportunities for students, uh, that being college and high school, such as AP courses. Uh, two would be uh, having diverse staff. Uh, so that would be training to serve communities uh, like White Center. Um, yeah. Our school is predominantly white teachers. We don't really have uh, a lot of other uh, uh, like teachers of color. So that's something that we are asking for. Um, but also, we're asking, number three, we're asking for a safer, uh, safer school environment. Uh, for example, more security just to feel like we belong here and we feel safe to walk these streets. Um, also, remodeling school buildings because there's a number of po uh, problems that affect our schools. For example, uh, leaking ceilings, uh, very hot summers due to uh, poor air conditioning, uh, very cold winters due to uh, poor, um, yeah. And uh, mold, which is uh, something that affects uh, a lot uh, of the schools. And also lead in water. Um, 
And number four, we're also asking like for improvements in technology. Uh, so more modern technology, that way we have more access to just, um, I guess, more opportunities for us to expand our, our knowledge. Um, so yeah, I have this letter for you too as well. So. Thank you. May I, may I share your letter with under state legislators and your school board members? Yes. If, because, and thank you for acknowledging at the beginning that King County doesn't have a direct role in funding schools. But as a former school budget analyst myself, I know the importance of everything you just spoke to. Um, and um, I, I will share that King County now has a small um, pot of money that actually comes through sound transit. <coughs> Um, the legislature in um, some last minute work session before last said that any, any um, sales tax that Sound Transit would pay within their taxing district should be um, remitted to the local county. So King County, is part of King County is Sound Transit's taxing district. We will receive some amount of money for about 20 years to invest in education. And, we're, and so this is the first time that, that King County has had money to invest directly in education. It's a new process for your county council. And we are looking at um, making sure that we don't just get every, um, spend a little bit of money on everything, but a couple of targeted focuses. Um, K-12 is one of those focuses. Early learning um, and um, strong preschool opportunities is another one. And then job opportunities, um, and particularly in that 13th or 14th year. Joe, you know, from what I heard, the county is looking for ways to spend the hotel motel tax. Could that be an option uh, for maybe providing a little more uh, than just the sound transit funding? The legislature restricts what the hotel motel tax can be invested in, and no, education is not one of those permitted expenses. Joe? Yes. I got a statement to make further. First of all, all of our governments are spending a great deal of money on homelessness. Now let's compare homelessness with an incurable disease. How do you cure a disease? You don't treat it, you find the cause. Now I don't see any government people trying to get at the cause of homelessness. They're treating it. So we're not going to ever get any place. It can go on forever. Thank you. A lot of our work recently has been um, trying to house people who, who are homeless at that time. And you're right, we haven't done as much work as we need to to address the causes of homelessness, to prevent people from becoming homeless um, in the first place. And that's exactly the work um, Mark and I have spoken tonight about one table, doing significant work to identify those upstream causes of homelessness and working to prevent homelessness in the first place. So that is, the current work that's going on to house people who are currently experiencing homelessness um, does its work in their house. They're not replaced by new people becoming homelessness. Spot on. Rudy? Thank you. My name is Rudy Garza. I'm the, co the coalition coordinator for the Coalition for Drug-Free Youth. We work with Evergreen High School, Cascade Inn School, and New Start High School, as well as all of the unincorporated area King County. Uh, the issue that we're facing in the schools with our youth, and it's increasing every year, is the availability and accessibility of marijuana. Not so much drinking anymore, not so much tobacco smoking, but marijuana. And the kids are telling us it's accessible. And the reason they're using it are for all the reasons that we've heard here tonight. They don't have jobs, they don't see opportunity, they don't have a future, they don't feel like they're part of the community. And then I see the number of marijuana stores in our community, and I'm wondering what kind of a structure are we building for them for the future when they see that it's all around them, so it must be okay to use. Where does this stop? Who makes the decision as to how many retail stores are going to be available in our community? Before we turn it over to Jake, let me point out. <laughs> Let me point out that um, what we are doing is on, on in, enacting a state initiative that was a public vote to legalize recreational marijuana in the state of Washington. And 
Um, so the state and your local jurisdictions, including King County, then take action on zoning and, and work toward that. But let's remember that it's in response to an um, initiative um, voted and approved by the people to make marijuana a, a legal controlled substance within our state. Jake, if you can speak to some of the zoning questions. Thanks, and thanks for your question. I actually sent you an email a couple of weeks ago, I didn't know if you got it, about our study and wanting to, uh, to talk with you about it. So, um, yeah, and I responded to that. Oh, I, I didn't see that. So, um, we are looking at ways to make sure that there aren't concentrations of marijuana businesses, that these are spread equitably, um, and also that they, any impacts that they are having are being mitigated. Um, as I mentioned, there are uh, the council adopted regulations that will um, prevent new businesses from coming in and locating within a thousand feet of any existing business. The state also has a number of regulations to keep these businesses away from schools, playgrounds, um, daycares, and other youth-oriented uses. Um, I, don't, I don't know if public health might be able to speak a little bit more to the youth use side of things, but um, the state's um, report from last year found that there weren't any significant increases after legalization in uh, youth use. So um, we want to make sure that the legal industry is being regulated and that it is not having any uh, impacts and not getting into the hands of the youth. But we also know that the, there were and are still illegal means that uh, youth are getting those impacts to. So a huge part of that is education, um, educating youth on why they shouldn't use marijuana, um, why um, you know it is bad for their developing brains uh, and and can can have negative impacts. Um, I don't know if public health has any any other thoughts on on those kind of health impacts. Well, one question you could ask is where are the youth exposed to marijuana stores and where in Yeah. And how are they, how access, you spoke of issues with marijuana and the youth having access to it. Now, my understanding is you have to be of a certain age in order to get that access to marijuana. Now, not long ago when I was a youth, guess where I got my drinks from? <laughs> Other youth that looked older, that maybe didn't get carded, or friends would get them from their parents, or their brothers, or people like that. That's where the youth are getting drugs from. Well, they're, not, they're, not going, yeah. they're not getting it from the stores. No. So that, that, that's absolutely right, is that there are, uh, most of the people are not getting it from the stores. The Liquor and Canvas Board enforces that very, uh, very um, strictly. When I went and visited, uh, I've been to every single one of these marijuana retail stores in unincorporated King County. I don't think anybody here thinks that I look under 21. Uh, I got credited at every single one of them. Um, so they take that very seriously, um, and there are not very many, uh, I don't think there are very many youth that are purchasing. What about the illegal room? store in not, downtown White's Bedroom? What's that? What about the smoke shop? It's an illegal operation. Yes, away. and, and we, want to, there. we want to stamp those out any way we can. And I think the, the, uh, the state and I think the sheriff's office did great work in, in shutting down that one that was there. It should do. It, it just bumped two doors down and reopened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I can't speak challenge. any more to that one because I'm not familiar with the law enforcement aspect of that case. And one thing you could do is answer the question, um, how many how many stores are operating in unincorporated King County, and enumerate the communities where they're located. There are twelve, I believe. There are three in Top Hat, three in White Center, one that it, two that are operating, and one that is licensed but not operating. Uh, there is one in unincorporated Federal Way that is in the process of getting permitted. There are two on Vashon. Um, and there are five in Skyway, West Hill. Where are they, what about the rest of the county? So you've covered, Outside of the unincorporated you've, 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 you've covered maybe 50,000 of the 250,000 <coughs> population. Uh, the communities you enumerated are, are uh, about one-fifth of the 
county's population. So a number of the community business zones and regional business zones where these businesses are allowed are distributed throughout the county and the Fairwood, um, Coalfield, there are some out by Snoqualmie Pass, there are others in Fall City, near Duval. Some of those have uh, restrictions. They're too close to youth-oriented uses, for instance. Uh, some of them have other issues, uh, perhaps critical areas. Um, but there are businesses that don't have, or there are properties that are zoned correctly and to have marijuana businesses and don't have any of those buffers applying to them where none of these businesses have located. But they could, so have, they could have businesses operating there that have an interest in staying in business, too. They, they, could, they could operate there if they went through the permitting process, um, but they have chosen not to locate there. I, I think that's disingenuous. Uh, uh, I'm aware of, um, in, in, in Skyway, for example, that there's a couple of businesses that, by your logic, have chosen Skyway as the best place to be, and they're not even pulling in $50,000. I can't speak to why they chose that area, or maybe there are other places that aren't, um, you know, landlords are not willing to rent to them in other parts of the county. Uh, maybe they want to be there because it's a more dense area than many other areas of the county that are very rural and don't have a lot of traffic. Could be a, a number of that. Another Please. Th thank you, Mark. Community Mark community thank you. you mentioned that. Mark? Um, that I, I just want to make sure that everybody has a chance to speak. I can do general. Can you get the numbers? We don't have them. Okay. But I can talk about that. Okay. So the answer is the legislature has decided where the money goes. And it's fairly complicated. Um, we are currently working on a study to be able to show where that money goes. <clears throat> our council has made decisions about where our allocation of state money goes, but we don't know the rest. We will have a report in the relatively near future. What is it? Is, it, is it safe to say that the money is not coming back to the community? Well, I think, you know, let me, let me give you a challenge. If you're interested in having money coming back to the community, I think you should be looking at the money that you're giving to the city of Seattle. About two-thirds of the sales taxes, local option sales tax that you pay, goes to the city of Seattle. It subsidizes services inside the city of Seattle. Uh, all of unincorporated King County has about 4% of the sales tax base, but you pay the same taxes that everybody else does. You just pay them to cities. And I think there should be, I, I'm a short timer here now, so I can say things like this. I think you guys ought to be thinking about how do we change the tax system so that we get the money that we pay for local services to be able to deliver those services to our communities. Amen. And then those monies get spent on those services. And that's a lot more than marijuana money. I didn't answer oh. the question. Yeah. Uh, how many been in business for how many years now and not have a account of like where the money is going? And it's many, I mean, it could be millions, it's millions, at least millions of dollars. Yeah. Karen, formerly Freeman. Yeah.
council has made one set of land use decisions. We've made some amendments to that, and I think we will continue to do I, the work. I know you're not happy. I, I, I'm I'm other concern. I, and, I guess I'm encouraged, Mark. I'm informed by that. Oh, Thank you. I, I'm one last question to tonight, Barbara. I just this is on another topic.
spread over five different municipalities, <coughs> and I don't think that we need direct funding in order for there to be a partnership with the schools. Well, uh, we do have a partnership. Um, I'm a very big fan of, of Susan's. I think you have one of the best, if not the best, uh, superintendent in the state. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Rhonda Perry is working on zero detention. There is a group that we formed around that about four years ago that Susan is a part of. It's trying to be, the idea behind this group was to have um, both um, uh, political leadership, like superintendents and police chiefs and others, council members, as well as community leaders to get together and try to figure out what these kinds of partnerships could be. I think there's been some real good successes down in, um, in federal way and some programs that have been put together for kids. I think there's been some good things that have happened in terms of what uh, the partnership with Highland School District. As I said, one of the things that Susan has been astonishingly good, in my opinion, is reducing the uh, suspensions in the school district, which I think is a, will have a significant long-term effect. And there's a lot more work to do. Thank you very much for um, your investment in your community, your participation with us tonight, both in Harold's online format and in our conversation. Would you please join me in um, thanking Sheriff Joe Hicknick, Deputy Executive Jarrett, and the Department of